Hi, welcome to Paleo Perks. We're back um, in 2023 and really excited for our first talk of the year. Today we have Robert Padalano from Bryant University in the US, and he's going to be talking about the uh, Yusambara Mountains Archaeology and Paleoecology Project. This talk um, was um, uh, sponsored by the Quaternary Research Association, um, so we just want to thank them for their, for their support. The format of today's seminar, if you are at, um, attending a Paleo Perks talk for the first time, is that we will start by doing um, welcome and announcements, which is what's happening right now. Then the talk will proceed. That'll be about a, a presentation of around 30 minutes. We'll do a moderated question and answer session um, with uh, questions from the audience. And then after um, afterwards, if there's time, um, Robert has offered to stay until noon um, to uh, to have a little tea time. That's our informal question and answer session um, where we can chat about anything that you would like with the speaker. Um, and uh, don't forget to send your questions via chat to the questions at Paleo Perks host, who today is Ray Matt. Um, do, uh, you can ask questions um, to the host via the chat anytime during the talk. So if something comes up and you don't want to forget about it and you want to make sure that it gets asked, um, send that in the chat to the host. Just some um, quick housekeeping before we get started. Uh, paleo Perks values the participation of every, everyone interested in the paleo sciences. And we just want to remind you to abide by our code of conduct, which you would have had to review before you were added to our mailing list. Please mute yourself for the duration of the talk. Again, you can ask questions by chatting them to the um, questions host or by using the raise hand function at the end of the talk. That's during that moderated Q&A session. If you have any technical issues, send those um, issues to the questions at Paleo Perks host as well. Uh, we have closed captioning built into Zoom, so you can use the CC button to show or hide them anytime. Um, and also we're looking for new committee members. So if you're interested in being our committee, please get in touch with being on the committee, please get in touch with us. It's really fun. Um, you get to meet a lot of really cool um, early career paleo researchers and be a part of an effort that I think is really, really, uh, really impactful. We're also looking for nominations for um, speakers, always. So if you um, know any um, outstanding early career researchers that you would like to see on this forum, please uh, send those to us as well. We'll put a link in the chat for speaker nominations. Um, we are also doing um, a weekly, we do a weekly feedback form for demographic info. It's totally anonymous and optional, but we really encourage it. We'll put a link to that in the chat as well. We use that to try to understand who is coming to see these talks. So today we are really excited to be joined by Robert Padalano. He got his bachelor's at Bryant University in the U.S. His uh, bachelor's at the his bachelor's woo his master's at the uh, University of New Haven. Um, he did his Ph.D. at the University of Calgary in Canada, and then a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for uh, the Science of Human History, which is now called the Geoanthropology. Um, Institute in Germany, and he's currently a lecturer at Bryant University in the U.S., so he kind of went full circle back to his alma mater. And we're really excited to be um, joined by Robert today, and whenever you're ready, Robert, you can take over the screen share and start your talk. Okay. Um, thank you for that incredible introduction, and uh, thank you for having me to, to, you know, come and give this talk to everyone. And for all of you in the audience, thanks for joining today. Um, I know New Year, everyone's really busy. Uh, so really, thank you for taking the time to, to come and hear me talk, you know, for the next half hour or so about a, a fairly new project um, that my colleagues and I launched at the some point in 2021, um, focusing on sort of the archaeology and paleoecology of the Usambara Mountains in Tanzania. Um, Really spectacular place. Uh, I'll go through some of the research we've done in the last year uh, in today's talk. But um, yeah, really, really amazing location, uh, really unique in terms of its ecology and sort of evolutionary history. Um, so I, I hope you guys enjoyed. I had a, a lot of fun, you know, working on the project or having a lot of fun working on the project and really excited to see where we can take this forward. Um, just want to do a shout out to a lot of my colleagues, uh, you know, those uh, at the Max Planck Institute for Geoanthropology, specifically Patrick Roberts, uh, and, and my con close contacts and, and friends at the University of Dar es Salaam, 
uh, specifically Dr. Mackie Tambu, um, who, who sort of co-PI on this project and helping me lead, you know, a lot of the field work and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll, I'll jump into it, give you a sort of a brief overview of the work we started in October 2021, and then the field work we did in July, August of last year, uh, and then sort of end with future perspectives and where we plan on going. So today we're going to visit Tanzania, and, and you're probably familiar with Tanzania. Um, it's an East African country, really well known for its safaris and you know the Serengeti migration of the wildebeest and the zebra. Um, and maybe you've heard of places like Zanzibar, the really beautiful island off the coast, or Oldupai Gorge, where the Leakeys did some really pioneering work and have really advanced our understanding of human evolution uh, going back to you know, 2 million years or so. And, and if you hadn't heard any of those, maybe you're familiar with Kilimanjaro, highest peak in Africa. Um, today, we're gonna focus on a, a, maybe a little uh, underexplored region in terms of its archeology. span um, So for, for those of you who are familiar with archeology span in sort of Eastern Africa, here are a bunch of you know, reported Middle Stone Age and later Stone Age sites. Uh, you could see many of these are focused around the Rift Valley in northern Tanzania and sort of southwestern Kenya, uh, along Lake Victoria and, and some of the Rift Lakes in that region. And then you'll notice there's sort of a big gap, you know, along the coast and, and sort of south of, of the Rift Valley. Um, and, you know, some of the projects that we're currently working on in, in Tanzania are can we fill in some of these gaps in central and southern Tanzania? And, and of course, sort of northeastern Tanzania, where there's sort of a big, big uh, blank spot. Now, I didn't really show um, any of the Iron Age sites right now. We will talk a bit more about the Iron Age later on. Uh, but yeah, there are Iron Age sites sort of up and down the coast uh, and then traveling inland as well. But um, one of the big things that I was really interested in about the Usambara Mountains is what was their Stone Age history? So that's why right now I wasn't really focusing on the Iron Age. Um, and another thing that really got me interested in this region is, you know, over the last 20 or so years, starting with Alison Brooks and, and some of her work in the Congo, uh, in Uganda, and in, in, uh, sort of a little bit to the, the west of the Rift Valley, um, people have really started to show that, that humans uh, have adapted to or exploited or occupied tropical forests. Um, going back 80,000, 100,000 years, and, and until somewhat recently, uh, it was always thought that tropical forests were sort of a barrier to human evolution. We didn't have great, you know, archaeological records um, in these parts, you know, in these biomes. And, and a lot of that has to do with just the projects, uh, you know, being hard to work in these environments. Um, when you know places like East and South Africa had you know over a hundred years of research history and things like that, so the Usambara Mountains. I had been working in Tanzania for for you know five or six years. I did my PhD um, at the University of Calgary on a project focused at Oldenbai Gorge, um, and then the Usambaras were always there. And as I started my postdoc in Germany and working with Dr. Patrick Roberts, who had a real focus on tropical forest, the startup getting interest. You know what else can we do in Tanzania? Where else can we look? for maybe Stone Age archaeology sites. Uh, and then over the last few years, you know, people have been showing in Sri Lanka, you know, 45,000 year olds uh, bone arrow technology to adapt to forest environments. And then just what, two years ago, um, the earliest burial known in Africa from the Pangaya Saidi site in Kenya, which is like maybe a hundred kilometers north of, of the Usambaras. So it all these, you know, pieces started coming together. Um, and, you know, it was fortunate in, in 2021, uh, we did a, a small pilot season um, in the Usambara Mountains. And then today I'll, I'll really focus on the work we did in 2022. Uh, so the Usambara Mountains are here in northeastern Tanzania, as you can see in this map. Um, and they are part of this uh, montane sort of archipelago-like regional centers of endemism that you can see on the left side that stretch basically from Ethiopia all the way down to Southern Africa. And there are these little pocket mountain ranges that are really unique in terms of their biodiversity. Uh, you know, some species here are found nowhere else. Um, and, and some of them are shared across the mountain ranges. 
while others can only be found in you know a few of them. And it's it's really cool. And the Usambara Mountains are one of these you know in unique centers of endemism in northeastern Tanzania. Um, and they're they're broken into two parts. So there's the eastern western Usambaras, and they're separated by the Luangara River Valley. And you know, like I was saying, some of the plants that are found here are found nowhere else. Some of the amphibians you can't find anywhere else. Um, there's a species of monkey that you don't see anywhere else. It's really cool, right? They really are a biodiversity hotspot. Um, so what we wanted to do was say, what is the human history of this area beyond the last, you know, two, three thousand years? Um, because the Usambaras really are unique, and and you know, just from these slides here, you can see there are a number of different biomes, you know, right on the outside uh, of the Usambaras themselves. It's more typical of what you think of Eastern Africa, sort of this dry wooded grassland slash shrubland with acacia and comifora trees. It might be a lot of different grasses. It's really dry, separated by two rainy seasons throughout the year. But right when you get into the mountains, you know, you go up a little bit in ele ele uh, elevation, you see huge, huge changes. You get these really nice Afro-maintained tropical forests, these riparian forests. Um, and and I wouldn't I won't call them cloud forests, but there is a lot of moisture in this region, uh, and it, it is quite amazing the the difference you see within the mountains themselves from the surrounding landscape in terms of temperature and precipitation. And we'll we'll cover this a little bit going forward, um, uh, and how unique it can be, or how different it can be, just over a few kilometers. And then of course uh, there's plenty of agricultural land now, and this is really fascinating because. You know, what is it going to do to the local climate system and local ecology that we continue to change much of the Afro-Montane forest into agricultural plots? Um, so, so kind of really cool, really interesting in terms of its ecology, uh, specifically for, you know, going forward with climate change as well. So East Africa, if you guys are familiar, has really suffered from some intensive droughts over the last few years. And as the droughts get worse, it's going to cause quite a, a, a lot of disruptions in food security. Um, and what does that mean for you know the people in the area? Where are they going to go to get food, or how are they going to sort of transform local landscapes for for acquiring food? And the Usumbaras are, are really one of these regions um, that could be impacted big time by sort of you know climate change, man-made climate change, and uh, agricultural transformations. And this isn't anything new. It's really been going on for quite a while. Um, so like I said, uh, the Usambaras is, is one of the world's biodiversity hotspots. Um, and there are quite a bit uh, of plant and animal species that are found either just here or you know, here and some of the other local mountain ranges. And there are a few plants that have their closest, closest living relatives found in the Congo Basin over like 10,000 kilometers away. And I think that's really fascinating. And the idea is that, you know, at one point when sort of these tropical forests stretched across Africa, uh, back into the Miocene, um, the, the, the species had this, this opportunity to sort of migrate from the mountains down to the lowlands and, 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 you know, back and forth. And then as climate changed and Eastern Africa became a bit drier, uh, a lot of these plant species sort of got stuck in these refugium, which, you know, uh, are now these sort of mountain peaks that we find across Eastern Africa. Um, so it's really cool, you know, a lot of the plants, some of the bird species we don't see anywhere else, or if we do, they're very unique to, to other uh, nearby areas. Um, what I find fascinating as well is, uh, it's believed that through genetic studies on birds that these forests may have been here for the last 25 million years. And one of the ideas is that because the Usambaras are under the climatic influence of the Indian Ocean monsoon, um, this, the, the climate has been warm and humid and fairly stable since the Miocene. Um, and that's why you get sort of the, these refugia of, of widespread plant, plant communities uh, existing nowhere else or existing in, in very few spots. And there's been a lot of work looking at the Usabaras in terms of their biodiversity and the need to um, preserve them. Because, you know, like I was saying, as climate changes, we don't know what the long-term impacts of this region will be. But in terms of like the archeological history and sort of the, the actual paleoclimate or, or paleoenvironmental work 
There have been few published studies. Um, Peter Schmidt did some work uh, and others. Peter Schmidt, Paul Lane, and, and a few others were doing some work in the Usambaras in the 80s and early 90s, really looking at the Iron Age uh, activity in, in the site. Um, and we know, like I said, the Samba people have been living here for at least 2,000 years. Uh, and when they first got to the area, there was a lot of iron working activity, a lot of smelting, a lot of clearing forests to sort of uh, heat furnaces and things like that. But beyond those, you know, early Iron Age activity, we don't have a really great record of human sort of occupation or human resource use in the tropical forest of the Usambaras. Now, in terms of, of climate change and paleoecology, you know, it is believed that the forests have been there since the Miocene. Um, but again, we don't have any real long-term studies showing this through proxy evidence beyond a few pollen studies uh, some fossil analysis. Um, but again, those really only stretch over the last four or 5,000 years or so. Uh, and they were able to document that, yeah, there have been some changes through sort of wet, dry climate cycles. Um, but again, what I've really been interested in is it, what was going on in the Pleistocene? Um, you know, when did people first arrive in this area? Was it back, you know, 40, 50, 60,000 years or further back in time? Um, how does this compare with other records across Africa for uh, tropical forest use and tropical, tropical forest exploitations? And then can we find and use a, a number of different proxies to really look at the past uh, vegetation changes and climate changes and stuff? Um, and, and, you know, uh, sorry, I should have, should have mentioned this. So uh, um, that's sort of the long term. But we also really interested in the, the more recent history of, of the area. And like I had said, um, climate change and the impacts of, of modern man-made climate change could be really severe in this region. And we really want to know how this is going to change things going forward. Um, but also really looking at how things have been changing over the last 200 years since the colonial period. So German colonialism you know, began in, in late 1800s. Uh, and the Usambaras really reminded some of the German colonialists of Germany and, and some of the mountain ranges. And this area became a special economic zone for growing crops, uh, you know, tea and coffee, and then uh, fruits and veggies, uh, and then eventually, eventually sisal. Um, but a lot of the forests at the time were cut down. Uh, a lot of the sort of the virgin growth forests were removed and transported off to the coast and then shipped back to Europe or, or other places of the colonial empire. Um, so there was, a, you know, early on, and by early on, you know, 200 years ago or so, there was a lot of modifications to the forest immediately when, when colonialism began. And then after World War I, the British took over. And again, there was a big push towards um, plantation crops. Uh, and again, more and more for sisal, specifically around World War II, uh, this area became a huge sisal plantation uh, for making ropes that would then be shipped to, to Europe for, during the war. Um, and then, of course, since since independence in the 60s, uh, the Usambaras have really supplied a lot of food to places like Dar es Salaam and Tonga, both both on the coast. And, and still, there is a lot of human activity, a, a lot of um, plantations and, and agricultural crops throughout the mountains today. Uh, so one thing that we're really interested in is how has the how have these landscape changes over the last 200 years really changed the hydroclimate of the region? Uh, and we know that there used to be a lot more rivers uh, coming down from the mountains that are just dry now. Um, so we're kind of interested in, in how that's going to play out over the next couple decades. So in uh, July, August 2022, we did an extended field survey, uh, three, four weeks. Uh, and in that survey, we visited 22 rock shelters and six open air sites. So you can sort of see those here on the map. Sorry for the very small dots and, and the colors. Um, but a lot of the rock shelters that we really focused on were on the Bangala River uh, and sort of the, the lower stretches and then sort of the upper stretches of the Bangala River here on the southwestern part of the Usambaras. And then we did a, a, a lot of surveying throughout the Luangara Valley because it likely acted as an ecotone between the resources of the mountains and the lowlands. Um, and, you know, if there people were here going back tens of, you know, thousands of years, uh, it would have provided new or, or different resources from, from the uplands, from the highlands themselves. Uh, we visited um, some off-site locations as well, 
where we know there's a lot of Iron Age uh, sites, you know, pottery all over the ground, probably these big settlements where pottery was being produced. Um, and we also did some, some ecological baseline sampling. So that's what you kind of see here in the green dots, looking at sort of the drier communities, plant communities here, and then uh, a bit of the, the upland plant communities. Because we're really interested in changing ecology, you know, in the past and then going forward. So we need to really look at some uh, modern baselines to really get an idea as to uh, what our proxies will mean in the future. Um, I also have here, we, you know, we uncovered about 400 artifacts. I put the artifacts in quotes uh, because a lot of these, you know, a lot of the, the, the quartz pieces that we found or the charcoal that we found hasn't been extensively studied yet. So I don't want to say they're man-made or, or um, specifically archaeological artifacts yet uh, until we do a proper analysis. I will show you some of the, the, the clearly man-made artifacts uh, in a few slides. Um, but again, yeah, we found quite a bit in, in our survey, but I won't say that they're, they're sort of archaeology yet. Uh, I'll start right now with a, a look at the, the paleoecology or, or the baseline ecology and why we're doing that. Um, so some of the things that we're really interested in is really visiting the nature reserves. Uh, and these are the modern day nature reserves. And we know, um, like the Magamba forest that, that we're visiting right now, um, in the past was actually logged quite heavily by German colonialism during German, German colonialism. And, you know, this is kind of alarming because we, we think, oh, there's a lot of uh, protected spaces in the Usambaras and natural vegetation. But you know, as we're there, we sort of find out that no, most of the, the native uh, forest had already been cleared. Um, and what you see now is secondary growth. And it's like, oh, that's wild. Um, because you know, is there really any area of the Usambaras that is virgin forest? And what we found out is there's really only one protected space that was sort of a colonial um, private property. And, and you know, the, the, the individual who owned the land didn't want to cut down uh, and it eventually became a nature reserve, um, sort of on the, the, the eastern part of the West Usambaras. But we visited the Magamba and a few other nature reserves and um, went with one of the local botanists uh, to, to do these sort of transects, uh, altitudinal transects uh, across some of the valleys, like you can see here, uh, going on different slope faces. Um, so I didn't put a north arrow, I should have done this, but. Uh, the, the left side of the transect where the, you can see the big A, that face is actually uh, facing southward, where uh, on the right side where you see the B and C, that face of the slope is facing northward. So you can see here over our, I don't know, 100 meter or so transect uh, in terms of 100 meter in, in elevation, uh, about a kilometer or so in, in terms of length. Uh, we visited a few different plant communities. You can see on the A and C pictures, that we're really seeing sort of drier, higher altitude uh, scrub uh, bushes, um, some ferns, some mosses and grasses. But really, when you get down into the valley, uh, you total change. You know these these huge trees, uh, ten meters higher, if not more, um, and uh, a, a lot of fruits and, and things like that. We did see some some of the. Uh, the black colobus monkeys in the area while we were visiting. And, and it's really cool. The, the changes are really interesting. So why we're taking samples like this? Well, we want to see if there are, you know, altitudinal differences related to temperature and precipitation that really dictate the plant communities. And then when we do our paleoecology studies, we can use this as sort of an inference to see how things were changing in the past. And were they changing based on you know, regional or global climate shifts or temperature shifts or precipitation shifts. We also did uh, another survey um, sort of on the southwestern slope of the Usambaras called Nkambe. Um, this was a extremely difficult day. Uh, if you're afraid of heights, I, I, you know, this place is not for you. In the morning, it was really wet, slippery, uh, a lot of rocks. Um, but really spectacular vegetation and sort of one area that uh, largely um, uh, hasn't been sort of uh, sort of cut down or, or modified by human activity until somewhat recently. Um, so I just wanted to show this. We did sort of descend, ascend about 200 meters um, up and down uh, across this transect over about 880 meters, so a fairly short 
um, transect. So, you know, we visited some rock shelters here, did some baseline studying, and, and this was really an intensive day. I, I was quite dead by the end of the day, um, but really spectacular just to get to see this and look at how plants change over this altitudinal changes coinciding with temperature. Uh, and, you know, as we were doing this, I was monitoring this on my watch uh, and we hit, you know, just over this 800 meters or so, 470% of our, or, or my daily activity uh, just in this climb. And I, and I thought that was crazy. And like I said, um, we got to see some really spectacular views and really cool plants and some interesting rock shelters. Um, but yeah, really tough, really hard place to work. Um, so we'll, I don't know, we'll see if we go back and excavate here, uh, it might be down the line uh, a little bit. But we did visit, you know, like I said, 22 or so rock shelters, uh, some really picturesque, like you can see here, uh, some that were quite large, like in the middle, some completely, you know, covered up by vegetation that, that we, we had to go in and clear or will have to go in and clear. And then some with really spectacular floors and, and really big spaces. Um, that still have a, a lot of spiritual connection with the local people and local communities. Uh, so we didn't excavate in some of these because of that. We, we really want to make sure that we, we get in um, and let the local communities know what we're doing and why we're doing it and, and how we can sort of get them involved before we start going in and, and digging in any of these areas. Um, but we did visit 22. Some of them were really spectacular. Some of them like here on the left that although looks spectacular, had a very shallow rocky floor and, and really not great for excavation. Uh, the one here in the middle, um, again, really fantastic, really huge space, but has been being, um, I sh I'll say excavated, but you know, local treasure hunters have been working in this, this cave for about 40 years, I think they told us, and, and finding some amazing stuff um, and trying to sell it off. And, and you know, that's, that's gonna happen in a lot of archeology. span um, them claiming, you know, we found human skeleton, skeletal remains, some of the robust, ro most robust skeletons we've ever seen. You don't know what our, our stories and, and tall tales and whatnot, but really fascinating cave that hopefully we can work with the people who have been working here um, for a long time. Uh, so some of the plans going forward are really, you know, can we revisit some of these rock shelters and really do proper excavations beyond the, the test trenches that we did last year? And then one of my favorite locations, this is the Luangara Valley, as I mentioned before. And you can see now it's mostly agricultural plots. Um, but in the past, uh, about 100 years ago, and then I just heard really up into the 60s, I think, there used to be a lot of animals, you know, your really famous African animals, the, the elephants and the buffalo, lions and leopards, uh, rhinos, all in this region, living in this valley. Um, Oops, sorry, let me just go back to that. Uh, and, and really unique and different from the, the animal communities living on the slopes. So one of the things that I had always thought was that if you're living in this region, this would be a great place to go down and find food resources that are different from on the slopes. You don't see it anymore, but there used to be a major river that cut through here. And this was a, quite a large riparian uh, river valley that only within the last century or so, not even, has largely been transformed to, to plots. And there are a lot of towns or, or sort of villages in this region now. Um, so, so I think like if there's a place to really go and find long-term uh, evidence of the, the paleoclimate, paleoecology, it'll probably be in this, this river uh, and a lot of the river sediments. So we're gonna really focus on this uh, going forward. And as we were surveying in this region, we did find some really interesting uh, stone tools, some, some uh, lithics, some quartz lithics, like this quartz biface that as far as I'm aware, um, is the first reported, I, I don't know, I, I'm not sure if that's 100% accurate, but uh, we did find some really cool quartz uh, bifaces. Of course, just looking at this, we can't get a, a general estimate on age. Yes, it could extend as far back as the middle stone age, but people um, were making you know, quartz stone tools up until the, the Neolithic and Iron Age. So I don't wanna say much on, on age yet, um, but we did find some really cool, fascinating stone tools like this biface um, and like this preferential flake that could very well be Lavalois or just discoidal, um, but really fascinating. Again, both of these come from the open air sites of the Luangara 
Um, and you can sort of see some of the flake scars as I put on with these dotted lines um, and sort of the, 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 the bulb. I, I know they don't look so great in, in, you know, on PowerPoint, um, but you can see where the platforms, where they are hit when you hold them in, in hand. And really cool. Uh, again, not sure if anything like this has, has been reported um, from this location. And, and maybe there is, and I'm just not familiar with it. Um, but, uh, you know, we were really excited to, to find these, these types of lithics. And we definitely want to go back and, and keep exploring and keep finding stuff. Um, and again, we found some, some really cool co uh, cores, um, some of the, you know, these platform cores. And again, really hard to see in the photographs, but you know, this could have very well been used for, for microlithics um, and you know, sort of these later Stone Age uh, adaptations that, that we see um, you know, across Africa and, and then sort of uh, much of Eurasia and, and North and South America afterwards. Um, but yeah, really exciting finding these pieces uh, in, in, during the field season. Um, and then we also found tons and tons of, of you know, Iron Age and later artifacts as well, like these Carnelian beads that were most likely imported from India between the 7th and 10th century. And um, at some of the open air sites we, we visited a bit south of the mountains, we found uh, pottery, tons of pottery and, and a lot of these beads. Uh, and really cool. It just kind of shows you the, the economy of the region and the, the connectivity, connectivity to uh, Southeast Asia and, and um, uh, specifically India. And then, of course, you know, everywhere we went, uh, China Ware pottery, really typical of Eastern Africa in, in this region, uh, found in, in many uh, parts of Tanzania or at least northeastern Tanzania. You can see sort of the, the, the classic Tana Ware patterns here with these sort of triangles and, and uh, lines uh, and, and dots. And then, you know, this fairly large piece that um, had this, this interesting hole. We don't know if it was for hanging. Uh, uh, one of the, the archaeologists that, that really focuses on pottery said it could have been used as a weight for throwing nets into, into water to catch fish. Um, so again, we really need to do a lot of analysis on, on some of the pottery that we found. Um, but it's cool. Uh, again, you know, I, I have always really been interested in the Pleistocene and the Middle Stone Age and Early Stone Age. And, but now when you go out and you find this stuff, it really kind of makes you wonder and, 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 you know, oh yeah, there's a lot more history here than just the earliest occupation. You know, what else has been going on over the last few thousand years? And then a, a lot of faunal remains in our, in our test trenches and some right on the surface scatter. So some that, you know, you feel them and, and they almost start feeling like they're, they're getting a bit uh, fossilized, maybe sub-fossilized. You can see some of the, the staining from, from uh, the manganese or, or one of these things. And then of course, uh, a lot of more recent uh, faunal remains. I think this might've been a porcupine jaw or something. Um, but yeah, we're finding these in, in some of the rock shelters and, and it makes you, okay, yeah. So there, there is some activity, even if it's not human activity, we know animals are, are visiting these shelters. Going forward, you know, after that season, what we really want to do now in, in sort of the next, um, you know, next field season or, or whenever we, we really go back this year or next year, whenever we get a chance, uh, continue our surveys really look at, at maybe the northern part of the Luangara Valley or sort of the northern edge of the Usambaras, you know, facing Kenya, uh, look at some of the river valleys there and visit some of the rock shelters in that part of the region. We definitely want to um, do some geotrenching or, or eventually coring of some of the wetlands along the Luangara um, and really see how sedimentology has changed through time and then take specific samples for, for paleoecology reconstructions. Um, and then compare that again with the modern baseline stuff and then some of the archeological trenches. And then we've target, targeted about four uh, rock shelters that we visited in 2022 for proper excavation. We really wanna go in now and do proper trenches um, and really see what we can find in, in situ um, in terms of the archeology span and the faunal remains and then do some dating on the charcoal uh, if we can, or, or maybe take some OSL dates uh, or OSL samples for dating. So this is sort of the, the immediate plan going forward. Um, but this is also, this project's also part of, of the greater Pantropocene project being, being led by Dr. Patrick Roberts at Max Planck. Um, and that project, although it's focused on sort of the Spanish empire and the impacts of colonialism in the Philippines and, you know, Southern and Central America, um, we figured, you know, this kind of ties really in nicely to that project. We can look at German and British colonialism and see how those influenced 
you know, local climate or local ecology of the Usambaras over the last 200 years, and then really kind of see, like I've been saying, you know, what that means going forward as man-made climate change and specifically the drought conditions in East Africa get worse over the next couple of decades or so. So it really is all tied in uh, to a lot of the work that, that, that Dr. Roberts has been doing over the last few years while being at uh, Max Planck. Um, and now, yeah, just kind of broadening that going from, you know, Philippine, Philippines and, and Southern and Central America to, to East Africa. Some of the, the proxies that we plan on working on, uh, you know, we already have our samples. We're, we're going to start hopefully doing this somewhat soon. But my specialty in plant wax biomarkers, you can see in this SEM photograph, the, the white crystals uh, are, are leaf waxes from um, a modern, a modern uh, reed plant. But, you know, these get trapped in soils and sediments, and you can really understand past uh, climate and ecological changes using the biomarkers. Uh, we want to look at pollen and, you know, phytoliths and diatoms if we find them, again, to really track changes in plant communities um, and, and looking at sort of uh, taxonomic classifications or, or taxonomic identifications for, you know, grasses or trees or things like that. And of course, uh, isotopes, uh, looking at isotopes on the fauna um, or, or anything, you know, any uh, organic carbons in the sediments or the biomarkers themselves. So we, this will be our, our sort of plan going forward for the, the paleoecology and paleoclimate, um, taking samples from the geo trenches or eventually the cores or samples directly from the archeological trenches themselves. And, and the big overall goals um, you know, of the project, we really want to identify the Pleistocene or at least early to mid Holocene evidence of tropical forest occupation uh, beyond the last 2000 years and, and when the Samba first got here. Uh, really look at the, the, the paleoecology and climate through a combination of those proxies to see, has this forest or have these climate parameters really been in place since the Miocene or as far back in time as we can get? Um, can we then link that information uh, to study the proposed climate resilience of the Usambars? Are they really a, a refugium, a climate refugium um, of greater Eastern Africa or in greater Eastern Africa? And then, you know, part of that Pantropocene project can we understand the impact of deforestation and converting natural Afromontane vegetation to agricultural plantations? What is that going to do to local precipitation patterns uh, and local river dynamics? So as I finish up, I, I probably over time, I just want to really extend a huge thank you to all my uh, friends and, and colleagues, uh, Dr. Mackie Tambu. Um, you know, we've, we've been working together for almost 10 years now and, and sort of working on this project together. Uh, really great student, Emmanuel Ngoe, uh, uh, amazing field person, uh, really brilliant. Um, I hope he can continue working with us now that he's graduated from the University of Dar es Salaam. Uh, Edie Nguatu, uh, actually one of the uh, local Samba that's been working with us and really just amazing in the field um, and huge, huge, huge. Uh, Cosmos Donko, who was our chauffeur, the guy who drove us everywhere and, you know, taking these crazy mountain roads. Uh, without him, we never would have gotten anywhere. Uh, Dr. Hassan uh, Sangarere, uh, our local botanist uh, from the Magamba Nature Reserve. Uh, really, really fascinating, you know, walking with him and him telling us all about the different plants and the different ecology and changing ecology as we do our transects. And then, of course, those members of Lushoto, Mambo, and Sony, uh, who helped us with the excavations and really took us to a lot of these uh, surveys, uh, sorry, helped, took us on the surveys to, to see the rock shelters. Without them, you know, we'd be lost completely. And of course, Dr. Patrick Roberts and the Pantropica team for, um, you know, allowing me and really guiding me in uh, the surveys and the archaeology and, and the paleoecology. And of course, thank all of you for, for joining. Um, here's my contact info. You can, you can send me an email. I'm also on Twitter and LinkedIn and, and uh, have my own website on Squarespace. Uh, like I said, uh, happy to stick around, answer any questions, or just have a sort of informal chat. I know I, I went through a lot of those slides fairly quickly. If there's anything you'd like me to really uh, highlight or go over again, please let me know. Otherwise, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you for that talk. That was really, really cool to hear about, um, yeah, your, the work that you and your colleagues have been doing and what you've been uh, finding up in uh, up in the Usambara Mountains. Awesome pictures. 
Um, I just actually, I need to ask everyone, um, if you have questions, can you send them to me instead of the questions host? Um, I'm just gonna be fielding those um, this time. We do have one, one that's come in already from um, Makaria Sitambu. Um, and he said, good talk, Bob. Um, do you think this year in 2023, you're going to discover more archaeological sites at the hilltops or at the lower Usambara? <laughs> uh, I mean, we always hope to discover new archaeological sites. Like I said, a lot of these rock shelters are already known uh, by local communities, and it really is just getting and working with them to make sure that what we do, you know, means something to them. We don't want to just go in and say, like, hey, we want to find your uh, find the, the the human history, the paleo uh, ecology history of this area. We want the local communities to be invested and involved and want us to do this or want to get involved. Um, so really, I, I think one of the big goals, and, and I didn't really quite mention it, is education, outreach, knowledge mobilization, really get, get local people involved and interested in what we're doing uh, before we try and go and discover new sites or whatever. Really just talk to people and, and get them interested. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from um, K. Sender Sarawan. Um, let me um, put this in the chat. Any ideas for using your archeological data for paleo conservation biology, i.e. how to preserve these diverse communities further? Yeah, that is an awesome question. And uh, something that we definitely put in when we you know, wrote our grant applications um, because the archeology span and the paleoecology could be applied to uh, conservation of the the natural forest going forward, right? It, it in terms of cultural heritage, it'll mean quite a lot if we are able to show, yeah, people have been living here for such and such thousand years. Um, so one of the goals really is to use the data that we generate to help forest conservation. Now, again, um, this is tough because as I've been saying, climate change is having huge impacts on food security in Eastern Africa, and. It, it, there's always that you know, difficulty in saying, well, we need to protect this area uh, because of the archeology span or the paleoecology, when people also need this area to grow food and survive. Um, so I think that's gonna be a really delicate balance and probably something that's gonna have to come from you know, Tanzanians themselves, uh, Tanzanian authorities, different institutions there, um, and really have that be guided by them. And, and I you know, sort of stay out of it as the foreigner. You know, we know what kind of impacts we've already had in these regions. So, so uh, yeah, great question, tough question to answer. Um, but maybe down the line, hopefully, we'll have a, a bit better sort of outlook. Here's one from Jill that maybe relates a little bit. Um, how do local communities impact the pace of your research? Um, I, I wouldn't say that it slows us down. If anything, it helps speed us up because all of the, the 22 rock shelters that we visited, I, I think we were taken there by local communities. And if it wasn't for them or, or people in these local towns, uh, we'd be walking around blind. I mean, you can see how hard it would be to find a rock shelter in that dense forest. Um, so really without their help, uh, I mean, we, we, yeah, we probably wouldn't have been able to do as much as we did in the three week period. Um, and, and we think it's great having them involved and, and uh, we hope that they stay in, engaged and, and want to continue to work with us. Great. Um, another um, one from Jill, does human activity impact the reliability of the proxies you're going to focus on? Again, fantastic question. Um, yeah, there's always that issue in archeological sites where if there's any sort of, uh, change or, or modification to the sediments, you know, if people are living in a cave or rock shelter, are they sort of uh, mixing up the sediments or, or you know, their activity that's itself causing issues to the sediments? And that's a problem that we do have to deal with because then you're looking at a signal that may not be genuine. You might actually be getting a signal that is uh, man-made. Um, there have been studies down in Southern Africa looking at cave sites where humans actually brought in a lot of vegetation and they selecting specific vegetation on the landscape. And then when you're doing these pro proxy analysis, are you really getting a genuine understanding of the local ecology or just what humans are selecting for? Um, so there's always this issue. And that's why we need to work with like geologists and sedimentologists and geoarchaeologists to really help identify um, the sedimentology within the rock shelters to make sure that 
we can have you know human modified sediments and then also uh, geologically natural archives to study. Thank you. Um, here's another one um, from K Center Sar one. Can this preconceived notion of tropical forests being a barrier to human movement be a result of preservation bias in these regions and the difficulty that these regions pose when bones are getting fossilized? Yeah, both really. So, so um, as many people know that tropical soils are often acidic and bones don't often you know, preserve well in acidic soils. Um, so there's always been an issue with that in terms of preservation. It's almost similar to the reason why we basically have no chimp or, or chimp ancestor fossils, right, in Western Africa, uh, because they just don't preserve that well. Um, the other thing is tropical forests, you know, they're often difficult to work in. And, and uh, whether it's transporting field supplies or, or locating sites, you know, because you do have to clear vegetation at time. Um, so it can be difficult in that regard, just there hasn't been as much field work done in tropical environments as other places that are more open or dry or, uh, you know, like specifically in Tanzania. Um, and then in some instances, of course, there are political issues and, and just getting access to sites or, or you know, forming local co contacts to, to then work in sites. I think this is really changing over the last, again, like I said, 20 years. Um, there have been a, a bigger push to look at tropical environments and what that means for human activity. Um, and, and, you know, not just in Africa, but also Southeast Asia. And there have been a few really great papers to come out over the last few years showing that, yeah, humans have been in these environments and have been really coming up with some really cool uh, specific uh, adaptations um, to exploit food resources in these environments. Thank you. Um, here's one from um, Chin Lang. Did you use the drone to take the bird's eye view photo of the mountains, the one you marked, where you marked your sampling sites? Uh, no, that was actually just from Google Earth. Um, I, I was just playing around with Google Earth. We didn't use a drone this summer, uh, this past summer, excuse me. Um, it's a plan maybe going forward. Uh, Mr. Ngo Ngoe, our, our undergraduate student is now looking to get his drone pilot's license. Um, it would make the surveying a lot easier. Uh, so we could sort of send the drone up these river valleys and, and sort of identify some of these rock shelters. So we're not, you know, walking kilometers a day up and down valleys. Um, but yeah, hopefully going forward, we can we can do some drone surveying and, and really drones take fantastic pictures. So it'd be cool to look at changes in plant communities up slopes using drone, drone photography. Okay, um, here's one. Um, lots of lots of good questions today uh, from Lauren Cole. How do you estimate the chances of finding a paleoclimate archive extending beyond the Holocene in the region? Yeah, uh, that's a that's a great question. Um, it's a tough question because you know if we're really focused on the rock shelters, yeah, there are plenty of rock shelters across Africa that have Pleistocene sediment deposits, um, but a lot of that has to do with again local climate. You know how much wind is bringing sediments into the rock shelter. Um, is it open or, or sort of which direction is the rock shelter mouth facing? Um, it's a bit harder in sort of tropical forest environments because sedimentation is a little bit different. Uh, sedimentation, you know, what's sort of the, the mechanisms causing it. So in the caves, you know, I, I like to think that there's going to be a slow buildup in these caves no matter what, or the rock shelters, excuse me. Um, and we will hopefully get some idea going back to the Pleistocene. But again, until we go in and really do the the, the archaeological trenches, we don't have um, we don't have a good understanding yet. One, some of the test trenches we did this past summer, uh, we got down to about seventy centimeters, mm -hmm. um, and that's pretty deep for for you know Holocene cave sediments or rock shelter sediments. But again, it's something that we really need to to go back and do some proper excavations to really see. Now, for the river valley, the Lungera River Valley. Um, there were some geo trenches put in and some other trenches put in that went down really deep, you know, a meter and a half or so, um, almost two meters. So I like to think that if we can go and sort of extend some of these geo trenches uh, in the Loangara, we can get a much later um, or much earlier signal beyond the Holocene. But again, before we go and do proper trenching, I, I, I won't say um, anything yet. And if it all turns out to be Holocene, well, like I showed, there's some really cool pottery, there's some really cool beads, and at least we'll have a cool 
Holocene slash colonial record. Thank you. Um, so I actually, I think we're not going to have time to keep you for tea. Um, so I just want to, I want to wrap up soon um, so that you can get to your, um, so that you can get to your class. But I wanted to ask um, if there's anything you'd like to say ne um, about exciting things that are coming next for um, some of these specific analyses um, on, or maybe follow-up studies. Yeah, uh, so the, the plan is to, to go back and, and do some more archaeology and more surveying and, and some geo trenching. And in the meantime, you know, over the next few months and the winter months, uh, really look at some of the um, preservation of the paleo proxies in both the, the modern samples. Hopefully everything's in the modern samples, but some of the sediments we took from some of the geo trenches and, and test trenches uh, to really make sure it's all feasible um, and, and really start calibrating our modern baseline to the paleo stuff. Um, beyond that, yeah, really, you can just follow me along on Twitter, uh, or, uh, you know, I'll post updates as I go. Um, and just, yeah, I don't know, we're gonna, we're gonna slowly do some of the work and, and analyze some of the stuff we collected last summer and then go forward and hopefully find more, you know, uh, more artifacts and things like that. Thank you. I, it's been really great to hear about this work and thank you for, um, sticking around for questions. Um, and, uh, and I, uh, really appreciate it. I'm just going to wrap things up really quick. So I'm going to take over this, um, screen share, um, to close us out. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, please, if you get the chance, fill out our weekly feedback form that was linked in the chat. Um, so we can learn more about who came today. Um, uh, please join us again and nominate speakers. Um, if you know any early career researchers that, that you would love to hear from. Um, also join us next week where we will be having a seminar by um, Vijayananda Sarangi um, from the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences called Neglecting Vegetation Fires as a Geochemical Process Could Undermine the Reliability of uh, Paleoecological Interpretations, which sounds really cool. So join us next week um, at the same time, same place. Um, and thanks, thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you all for attending.